The reason being, SCCM is just an extension for your uh, traditional systems administrator, right? So what does a, a system admin do? So he would create user accounts, he would create computer accounts, he would manage your uh, domain, uh, he'll be logging into your domain controllers, right? Uh, he might be creating some group policy objects and making sure that um, uh, all your uh, computers, the client machines and the servers are healthy. Right? So those are the uh, typical uh, activities a system admin would do, right? So now it is an extension to it. So once once I start telling you why SCM and what SCM can do, you will understand better. But the same uh, system administrator activities, when you're talking about managing thousands of thousands of machines spread across the globe, and uh, different time zones and you wanted to push softwares to them you wanted to get the inventory or you want to push the uh, operating systems so that's when uh, you will be using a systems management software like SSCA right and similarly application packages so application packages are the guys who would create the softwares or uh, rather I would say who would package the softwares uh, into MSIs or MSTs so basically what will happen is, say suppose if you have uh, Adobe Reader, okay, or Google Chrome, or for that matter, any other application, which is already available from a third party vendor, and your company uh, or your client wants to use that application with some standard settings, okay? They wanted a few settings in that application, uh, which needs to be enabled and few settings needs to be disabled. Some services needs to be started. So such kind of custom actions, if there are any. So an, an application packager, he would makes, uh, make those changes to that application, right? So that's what we call as repackaging. So he, the final output would be an MSI or MS, MSI plus MST. So that MSI plus MST, when installed on any machine, it will not only just install the application, it will also make sure that all these settings are already taken care of. So that is what an application packager would do. So it is again an extension, SCM is again an extension for application packager because once the application packager creates that final package, right, the final MSI or MST, there should be a way to deploy these applications to multiple machines, right? So if it is just one single machine, you can uh, you can uh, just download that application MSI or EXE whatever and double click it, right? But when we are talking about thousands of thousands of machines, there should be a standard way to distribute and deploy those applications. So that's where SSM will come into picture. And similarly, SSM L1 and L2 guys. So in most of the companies, if you're a uh, if you're not a full-time employee and if you're just uh, coming as a partner or vendor, so they will not give you complete access to the console or to the servers. So in that case, uh, the L1 and L2 guys, what they would be doing is they will have a separate in-house tool developed by the company. Uh, wherein if you are making any changes to that um, uh, changes on that uh, in-house tool or a third-party tool in the back end it will be making changes to SCCM and uh, the activities the kind of activities that you do you are very minimal like um, adding machines to collection or adding users to a specific collection uh, or distributing a particular application right so L1 and L2 guys they also want to know what's actually going in the background right sometimes they will uh, have access to the console but again they'll have very minimal access uh, and their scope is uh, very limited right so they also want to learn uh, like what's actually going in the background uh, how to build a uh, SSM server right from the scratch and what are the advanced concepts or advanced um, techniques in SSM right so that's where um, SCM L1 and L2 guys would also allow to learn the complete uh, SCM so, so these are the uh, uh, traditional uh, roles that I've seen till date. So what is expected from you? What, what are the prerequisites? So the basic system admin stuff, as I said, so if you know what is a domain, uh, Active Directory, what's Active Directory, and what does a uh, domain controller would do, and then uh, DHCP, DNS. So those are very 
uh, basic concepts I don't want you to uh, you know uh, configure something in the DHCP I don't want you to configure something in DNS or on IS so these are the basic things if you just know like okay there is something called a DNS server which resolves the uh, name to host name to IP address and back IP address to the host name DHCP is a server which releases IP addresses and domain controller is the main server which uh, controls the entire domain or the active directory right so if you know the basic concepts of these servers that's more than enough because once I get into the actual SCCM right so you need to uh, I will be uh, using for example in case of operating system deployment I would say okay um, the server will go and get the IP address from DHCP and after that this is the process blah 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 so I'll be uh, going by step one step two step three so in that case I would expect you to already know what a DHCP is or what a DNS server would do right and in SCCM we also use IAS IAS is nothing but the web server so we use IAS uh, as well but all you need to know here is to install IAS if you know how to install IAS that's enough you don't need to know how to create uh, websites or virtual directories on IAS server because what SCCM would do is once you install IAS and after that if you are installing SCCM it would automatically configure the IAS right so it will create the virtual directories or it will create the websites what are all are required so it will do automatically so all you need to know is how to create an IS server right then uh, Windows patches right so if you know uh, what is uh, what are Windows patches and um, when are they released by Microsoft uh, why do we well, we need Windows patches right so if you know the basic things regarding Windows patches it will be very much beneficial when I actually get into the topics of software updates deployment I will tell you how patches can be installed and um, how to schedule them and how to get reports out of them so to check the compliance of the machines so when we go much deeper into the product and technology it would be better if you know the basic like what 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 are Windows patches right similarly the basic thing like software installation and uninstallation how to install a software and how to uninstall a software manually or if you know any scripting that would be better like if you know VB script or shell script it's better but that's not mandatory even if you know how to install softwares and uninstall softwares manually like uh, by giving some command lines or um, if you know you know just double click and install or uninstall from where do you uninstall it add remove programs or checking the registry for some uninstallations so if you know the basic stuff that would be enough right then a um, little bit knowledge on Hyper-V or VMware or any other virtualization technology because we will be creating our lab uh, in, entirely on um, one of those uh, we will create on Hyper-V VMware or if you don't have uh, a machine with enough uh, good RAM or uh, hardware then maybe we need to create uh, this lab on Azure on the cloud right so if you know the basic concepts of uh, how to create a new virtual machine and how to create a new virtual switch right so that will be much more helpful so when I explain in my uh, sessions um, to create a lab so it will be very easy for you to pick it up and start building your own lab and coming to the last and most important thing which is SQL installation and basic DB concepts so SQL installation uh, because SCCM completely depends on the back end, uh, in the backend on uh, SQL Server, so uh, the entire information like uh, all the clients that you're managing, right? So when you're managing the clients, you'll have the clients' inventory data, and you'll have, say, suppose if you have deployed a software, so you'll have the uh, when you have deployed and what is the status of the deployment. So all kinds of different information, right? Everything is stored. Uh, like every single transaction is stored on the SQL server in the backend so to have a lab so definitely we need to install SQL server as part of it so I would expect like little bit of knowledge on how to install SQL right and the basic DB concepts so when I say basic DB concepts it's like what is a table what's a view so little bit of query knowledge if you have that would be better so having said that anyways in in the class I will definitely go through when I'm talking about software uh, updates management I'll just give you a two minutes brief on uh, what are Windows patches similarly uh, regarding SQL installation so I'll share a video with you 
okay so using that video it will be a step by step uh, like to build your own lab so you can just go step by step through it to create your own sql server so in that video you will have how to create sql server you will have uh, how to uh, create ias server so all those things will be definitely be there but i'm just telling you so that uh, we don't waste time on um, learning these things in, in the session because our motto is not to learn the basic stuff our motto is to learn the, the advanced concept which is SCM. right guys so before i proceed with the next slide do you have any questions on this please feel free to ask anything um when heard this i uh... yes i go ahead Hello. so uh in the sql installation uh, we need the total uh, i mean which module uh the thing is uh, i've installed mm -hmm. some sql uh, sql software but i could not see the database I guess I have missed the management studio. So is the management studio is mandatory mandatory? Yeah, management studio is also part of this. We need to have management studio because sometimes um, once uh, we, we are through with all these operating system deployments and everything. So we will be in a position to write some queries, SQL queries uh, to get the data uh, from the database, right? So in such case, you need to have management studio. That's where we write queries and uh, test our queries okay and coming to the uh, basic system administration stuff uh, when we configure this uh, domain controller uh, i guess uh, dhcp and dns and ias this three services we just need to install that's it right we don't need to configure anything on that so uh, dhcp uh, dns we need to configure it a little bit that means you need to just create a scope um, in okay. DHCP. okay okay and even in okay. dns uh, you need to first uh, when the very first time you're building it you need to do the the basic stuff even for the dns however for ias all you need to do is just install that service on the uh, oh. server and later on once you install sccm it will take care of uh, from there onwards okay okay okay, okay. that's it makes sense yeah okay yes so Manju and Balu uh, do you have any questions Balu I've kept you on mute um, I'll unmute you yeah, Balu. So, do you have any questions on uh, any other stuff, Balu or Manju? Uh, no? Yeah, Balu. Go ahead. Balu, I can hear you. Go ahead. Balu? Hello? Yeah, Balu, I'm able to hear you. Mm, your voice is very, very low, Balu. I think you're away from the mic. Okay. Manju, do you have any questions or do you want me to proceed further? Okay, thank you. So let us learn now why SCCM. What do you need to learn SCCM, right? So the very first thing uh, in SCCM is inventory management. So uh, right from SMS 1.0. So previously SCCM used to be called as SMS. Um, there used to be SMS 1.0, 2.0, 2003. So I'll show you that evolution as well in the next slide. So before I get into the evolution, so why do you need SCCM? So predominantly what will happen is, say suppose if you have a small company of uh, some 150 machines, okay, and you wanted to get information like uh, what's the hard disk space, okay, or what is the uh, RAM, or you want to know how many NICs are there on that uh, machine, right? Whether it could be a server or the client machine or um, anything else for, for that matter. Um, so such kind of hardware details, say suppose you want that, what you would do is either you'll go ahead and create a script, small script, or else uh, in small companies I've seen wherein um, one technical uh, support guy, he will just move from one uh, desk to another desk. He will be noting down the uh, 
uh, the serial number of that uh, device and then he'll be noting down few more few other things right so in small companies typically what will happen somebody would be uh, walking uh, on the floor and uh, note down those details the hardware details right but uh, when we are talking about uh, large enterprises uh, that's not feasible we cannot um, it just uh, walk down and get all these details so and these details are very dynamically changing so what will happen uh, either you can create um, a script a vb script or a powershell script and get this data right but then even if you are creating uh, powershell scripts or any other scripting for that matter there will not be any standard uh, database where you can store store all this data and one more thing is when you're running the script the servers or the client machines they need to be live online at that point of time when you're running the script to get any information right because they, they will uh, go and query your wmi to get all this information so in order to uh, have a real-time data as well as a history data of all the inventory what you need to do is you need to have something kind of an agent sitting on that machine there should be a client agent which is sitting on all of these machines and periodically it should get, fetch all this data like uh, as i said the hardware data and also the software data like what are the softwares installed on, on that machine when is a particular software installed when is a particular software uh, uninstalled so all that information a agent will be sitting on the client machine and if that agent is noting down all these changes on that client machine or the server and sending back that information to a server or to a database right in that way what you can do is at any given point of time even if the machines are switched off or if they are in different time zones right in any time zone if the machine is still you can just query the database and find out okay how many machines do i have on 32 bit architecture how many machines are there with 64 bit architecture right uh, how many machines do i have uh, that has autocad installed on them Right. So such kind of inventory, if you want to pull out of the database, so you need to have a kind of an agent which gets all this data and puts onto the database. So that's what exactly SSM would do. So instead of relying on scripts, so in major enterprises, people would prefer to use some kind of systems management software. Right. So in the outside market, it's not uh, just SSM. So we have Altaris semantics alteris then we have uh, landesk uh, we have bmc marimba so there are many other tools there are quest tools so there are many other tools which do a similar kind of um, you know inventory management and other stuff however sccm is more popular because it being the uh, microsoft product uh, and all these windows um, all these servers and the client machines typically if you go to any other company you would find uh, 90% of the client machines are Windows machines. There could be few uh, Apple devices, Mac devices, and even servers. Most of them are Windows servers, and there, there could be few Linux or uh, you know um, other other servers. So since predominantly you will have uh, Microsoft servers, uh, Windows servers, and Windows client machines, uh, people would prefer to go with a Microsoft tool which can get all this information, and that is SCM. And in the beginning days of SSCM, it used to collect only Microsoft related server information or Microsoft related client machine information. But now uh, it has spread across and now you can get information on, you know, uh, Unix devices, you have Linux, you can manage, you have Macs, you can manage, even if you have mobiles, tablets, uh, smartphones. So every other uh, device that you can think of, you can still get the inventory using SSCM. Right? It's not only, uh, the scope is not defined only for Windows or Microsoft devices anymore. So what is the second biggest thing that SCM would do? Software deployment. This is the second biggest pillar. And most people know software deployment as uh, if they have to relate SCM. So most people would think SCM would do software deployment. That's the only thing it does. That's what uh, the common understanding. So as part of software deployment, uh, same goes again. In a small smaller enterprise, what you can do is if you want to install uh, um, a small, small application, either you will have an exe file or MSI, or uh, you can install using a batch file or a script, VB script or a PowerShell script or a command line. Using different um, executables, you can double click them or uh, 
call them in a script file and you can install right but again when i'm talking about larger enterprises like you have 5000 or 50000 machines right in such scenarios when you want to install applications um, it's not that easy uh, by just running a script so you also wanted to have an error handling right for example when you install an application it fails due to some other prerequisite say suppose it requests dotnet 3.5 okay and the application fails so if you're installing manually and you, uh, you did not know where it is failing and why it is failing on a different machine maybe on one machine uh, you can see it on the on the machine that you are physically uh, online you can see and it might pop up saying that okay dotnet 3.5 is not there but when you're trying to install on 100 machines using some ps exec or some batch script or some scripts, uh, PowerShell scripts kind of. So you'll not know what is the exact error and why it is failing on uh, machine X or machine Y, right? So this kind of error handling, uh, what will happen is when you are pushing it to SCCM, SCCM will not only deploy this application, it will also collect the exit code. Exit code in the sense, it could be a successful exit code like zero, or once the application is completed, uh, whether it is success or failure, it will get an exit code like zero is considered as a pass or exit code zero is successful. And then say, suppose you get 1619, 256. These are different MSI uh, errors. So these error codes or the exit codes are not thrown by SCCM. So SCM is not uh, telling you all these exit codes. Those exit codes are captured from the actual application. If the application is an MSI or EXE or uh, any other file. So whatever the error that that particular application throws that is directly captured by SCCM and put into the database so that when you query, when you run a report, you'll find out, okay, this application failed due to so-and-so error. And then if, if it is a standard error, it will also give you information, okay, the error means X, Y, Z. So that will help you in taking the necessary steps, right? So the kind of error handling and the kind of mass deployments, like thousands of machines and spread across uh, different time zones, and the, all the machines are not online. Say, suppose you want to push an application to some thousand machines but only 300 machines are online at that time right other 600 or 700 machines will get online during the night shift right you don't need to sit till the uh, night shift to push those other another 700 application so what you will do is you'll push all these 700 or, the, or you, you'll push it to all the thousand machines just by one click in the morning time and as and when the machines come online uh, this deployment will target those machines and uh, the machines will start downloading that application and install install them right so that's the benefit of software deployment and also there are much more advanced concepts to it which we'll discuss uh, in detail but if i have to just give you an uh, overview or highlights of that say suppose uh, if you want to install an application on your mobile phone right so whether it is um, ios or android or Windows Phone. So what do you do? You actually go to the respective Play Store, right, or the Windows Store, um, and then you search for that app and you download and you install. So this is kind of a self-service. So whatever application you want, you are searching against a standard database and then installing that, right? So this is kind of a self-service portal that you are doing. So similar ten thing can be set up using SCCM. So not always a custom, your end user required to raise a ticket to get an application. Say suppose he requires um, WebEx, okay? In order to attend a meeting, uh, he requires a software called WebEx. So instead of he raising a ticket to the SCCM team saying that I need WebEx and then you deploy WebEx to him, it's better if he has some kind of a self-service portal, right? So that's what we call here as application catalog in SCCM. So what you can do is you can just publish this WebEx onto application catalog and make it available for anybody to download and install. So now your end user, instead of raising a ticket on his computer, he'll go to application catalog, which is similar to your store. He'll search for WebEx and he'll just download and install it, right? So such kind of things can also be done using SCCM. Uh, which is we call as uh, application catalog and there are many other things uh, user based uh, deployments can be done or machine based deployments can be done so all that we'll learn uh, once we get into the software deployment sessions okay coming to uh, software updates management so this is the third pillar wherein all your machines are expected to be 
compliant with respect to these patches. So Microsoft would release these patches on every second Tuesday, every month, every second Tuesday, Microsoft will release these patches. And you are expected to install these patches on your machines because what will happen if you don't have these patches, your machine will be vulnerable for any kind of attacks from the hackers or you know, any kind of malwares or um, you know spamwares. So because of that, what will happen when somebody, um, when you're trying to access a particular website and if that website has um, you know some, some kind of uh, atrocious or something like that, so there are chances of attacking your device and getting the potential data out of it. So it's always better to in, keep your machines up to date with Microsoft patches. It's not only just for the security concern. Sometimes you have features, feature upgrades, like uh, you are on uh, Windows 10 and Windows 10 1511, say suppose, and Microsoft would release uh, Windows 10 1602. Uh, so what they would do is um, they will have some more features to it, uh, and only when you when you install the latest um, update or when you upgrade to the uh, latest branch of uh, the operating system, all those new features and um, all the different updates will get installed, right? Now, to make sure that since this is a monthly activity, right? So every month, some uh, hundreds of patches will be released by Microsoft because for every product that Microsoft manages, they'll have patches. It's not just um, your operating system. It's not just for your Windows XP or Windows 7 or 10. It's not for your Windows Server. Even if you have Microsoft Office, you'll have patches for that. Say, suppose if you're using Microsoft Visio Project, right? Or you're using .NET. So for every single thing that you're using, the Internet Explorer, so for every single uh, product of Microsoft if you're using, there are patches. So how do you manage all these different patches, right? So how do you know that what patches are required for each single machine? So every single machine has a different set of applications running on them. So every single machine has different requirements of patches, right? So how do you manage like which machine requires what patches and uh, how do you make sure that all of them are compliant? When I say compliant, uh, making sure that they have these latest patches installed on them. So how do you make sure of that, right? So again, SEC will take a uh, larger uh, picture on this. So what it will do is it will help you in categorizing these patches based on different products and then uh, you can distribute you can distribute based on um, different operating systems you can create collections and send these patches to them or based on different products you can uh, classify the uh, different collections and start pushing these patches and if you would uh, ask me about the latest concepts in SCCM you have something called ADR ADR is automatic deployment rules wherein you don't need to actually download these patches and push them to the uh, target machines, if you just create an ADR, it will take care of downloading the patches periodically. So every second Tuesday, if Microsoft releases the patches on second Wednesday, uh, this ADR will go and download the latest patches and then it will install those patches to the respective machines, right? So when, when we discuss about the software updates management, I can uh, discuss more about this and we will also see how actually it happens. You yourself will create these ADRs or you yourself will create the uh, software update groups and start targeting them to the different collections. Uh, Manohar, what is ADR? As I said, it's called automatic deployment uh, rules. So basically, what okay. you're doing, so what you're doing here is you're creating uh, rules uh, saying that okay, whenever Microsoft releases patches on second Tuesday or whenever Microsoft releases the patches, you are asking uh, SCCM to download these patches on uh, every second Wednesday and target these patches to a respective uh, group of machines, right? So instead of you doing it manually every week, every month, you can actually create a rule. So that rule will process and automatically uh, patches will start uh, installing on the machines. You get that, Sai? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. But uh, this is installed in client machine or else uh, in the server itself? Is it something like a uh, client uh, agent? No, no. So basically what we do is we configure all this in the SCCM console. Okay. So when you are creating this in the SCCM console, I will explain. So when we get into the software updates, you'll understand better. But just to give you a brief. So 
there'll be a console where you'll be uh, doing all these SSM administrative activities, right? So in that console, when you create a rule, so that rule will process in within the console on the SCCM server, it will process and it will start downloading first onto the SCCM server, all these patches, right? And then from the SCCM server, it will target to the uh, all these client machines. It will start pushing from the SCCM server to it. So the ADR is created on the server, not on the client machines. Okay. 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 And coming to the updates, software update, uh, uh, this is a Microsoft uh, product. Will it support Linux, uh, this thing also? Yeah, so even just like uh, we discussed about inventory, so here also Microsoft has already expanded its uh, presence uh, while uh, it can definitely help you in installing patches for Linux, Unix and uh, Mac devices and other kinds of devices. But then there are definitely some limitations. Right, and sometimes you need to install some connectors if you want to have uh, third-party product uh, softwares or updates needs to be installed. There are some connectors that you need to install, right? So it's not out of the box directly. It, it cannot help you in uh, uh, managing all these uh, Linux or Unix devices. I Means I mean to push updates. So you, if you can install those connectors, then yes, you can do it. And I, I can also. And there's one more thing. See, it's not about uh, the operating systems. We can also push patches related to third party uh, like Adobe, right? So Adobe, say suppose you have Adobe Flash Player or Adobe Reader uh, on your machine, right? Adobe also releases patches every month, right? So these patches, if you want to distribute using SCCM, yes, there is something called SCUP, uh, System Center Update Publisher, so scoop we call it. So you can integrate that with SCCM so that any third party uh, applications, you can still um, download those patches and install on these uh, these machines. Okay. Is it clear, Sai? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, coming to the fourth one, which is operating systems deployment. So Sai, have you ever done an operating system deployment? Maybe in your, on your laptop or VM. No, 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 no. I just completed the installation. That's it. Uh, but I guess uh, there is an issue with an SE, WSES and also the SQL Server. So uh, mm -hmm. I was stuck there. Okay. No, I, I meant not from SCCM. Even manually, have you ever uh, okay. built machines um, using your VMware or Hyper-V? Yeah, the software update, in a sense, uh, we normally go through the Windows uh, update. That's it. Actually, we have configure WSUS, mm -hmm. uh, from there we have pushed the updates. No, nobody, uh, I'm asking about the OSD. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, operating, software, software. operating system deployment, I'm asking about the operating system deployment. So yeah, have you ever installed like Windows 7 or Windows 10 or Windows yes, 7 yes. 2012, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. How, how do you install uh, a operating system? So how do you do it? Using uh, That's normally, uh, normally like uh, some uh, media player where we can uh, install it directly or else some something like image uh, sort of thing okay so you must have used uh, an ISO or you know CD DVD yeah, or I, maybe some image right yeah image uh, uh, we take take the image from a Linux we have some software there cloning mm -hmm. and everything we do it yep. so where we get an image file there we, we restore the images that's it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep yep so when you are building one single machine or one single server, okay, how, how much time it would take to build a server? Say suppose we, we'll talk about the client machine. Say suppose you want to build Windows 10 machine. So how much time it would take to build a Windows 10 to machine? To configure a Windows uh, the client machine, and it minimum takes an hour. The total configuration to till we hand over to an user, mm -hmm. one to two hours easily. Okay. And uh, uh, I could see my juniors where it sometimes takes three to four hours because they will be handling the issues and also the installation part. Yep, yep. So, yeah, that's really a big problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So typically, uh, as you said, what will happen is if you just want to install only the operating system, you're using a CD and just installing only the vanilla operating system. That means Windows 10 without any other applications if you're installing it would take at least uh, 40 minutes to one hour. On top of that, if say suppose if you're installing, um, uh, there's a, you have HP machines, you have Dell, you have different kinds of machines, Lenovo's and all that. So you need to install the required drivers, 
right? Once you install operating system, you install drivers. So drivers might take another 15, 20 minutes. Say suppose if those drivers are not in your Windows 10 uh, CD or DVD, you need to download those drivers from the respective websites and install them, right? So installing the drivers is second part. And after that, um, say suppose there are some standard applications like uh, .NET uh, needs to be there on every single machine. MS Office needs to be there on every single machine, right? So, or Adobe Reader needs to be there on every single machine. So some applications which are very common, we call them as core applications, which needs to be there on every single machine. So those applications you start downloading and install them. So that might take, even if you have some five applications, it might take like half an hour, right? 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And on top of it, now you need to install some specific applications for different users. Say suppose somebody is from uh, IT department, they have a different set of application they use and somebody is from HR, they have a different set of application they use, right? So based on their department or based on the, the kind of work they do, each department or each individual would need a separate uh, set of applications, right? So now what you need to do is before handing the laptop to the end user, you need to actually install these softwares as well. Uh, which are specific to that particular department, which are not the core applications. So, right, so we call them as optional applications. So now to install these optional applications and keeping a track of which user requires what application and then installing only exactly those applications, right? Now it is getting more complex, right? It might take another one hour, 40 minutes or one hour to install all these applications, right? And on top of this, say suppose tomorrow, say suppose you have already delivered to each individual, uh, you have created, uh, you have first pushed the operating system, then you push the drivers, core applications, and then the optional applications. So you took, you spent like three to four hours to give the user all this, uh, his brand new laptop. Now, say suppose if there is an issue on one laptop, okay, because of some setting is enabled somewhere and he's getting an issue. So finally you troubleshoot it. No. When I say you, it could, it might not be you. It could be the technical support or the help desk. So whoever it is, when they actually troubleshoot it, they find out that, okay, there is a particular setting enabled and because of that, uh, this issue is coming and they'll disable it. Now, when there is another user again coming with the same kind of similar kind of issue, right? So again, he needs to troubleshoot everything and find out, okay, this is the issue. And again, he has to implement that issue, uh, he implement that change to resolve that problem. So basically what is happening here is that when you're trying to troubleshoot, since all these machines are not having a similar kind of settings, there's no standardization across all these different uh, machines. So every time there's some kind of troubleshooting which is going on, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, root cause analysis which is going on there. So instead of that, what we can do is say, suppose if you create an image, okay, if you are standardizing, if you are creating an image saying that, okay, in this image, I'll have Windows 10 with X, Y, Z settings. And in this image, I will have all this .NET, Adobe Reader and which whatever or MS Office, whichever I think are core applications, which needs to go out for each and every individual. I'll put them in this image itself, right? So if you're creating an image, so when I say image, it's basically like, um, uh, for everybody's understanding, say suppose you have uh, just built a Windows 10 machine. On that Windows 10 machines, what you'll do, you'll in, you'll make some settings changes, right? For, for example, in your company, you might have seen, you'll get a standard wallpaper, which has your company name, right? And there could be some standard settings, standard screen savers and standard settings you'll have, right? So those kind of settings you'll do, and then standard set of applications, like I said, core applications, right? You'll install all those core applications. After that, using SCCM or MDT, what you can do is you can capture this into an image. So it will create a WIM file, WIM file, Windows image file. So it will capture that into a WIM file. And now wherever you install this WIM file, you don't need to install the operating system and um, you know the core applications. So the moment you apply this WIM image on any machine, they'll automatically get the core operating system, the standard settings and the applications by default. Right, so it will save your time as well as make sure that it is standardized. So there is no um, error prone, it's not error prone, right? Now what will happen in case of troubleshooting, the help desk are aware that, okay, if the image version is say suppose 1.0, okay, these are the issues expected and this is how we need to troubleshoot it. If the image is 2.0, okay, these are the issues expected in 2.0 and these are the bug fixes for that. So that way, there is a organized way of troubleshooting and it will save your uh, time in, 
you know to troubleshoot or make the machines uh, productive again and apart from this we were discussing about installing drivers and installing optional applications so as part of HCM, what you can do is you can actually have uh, all of them in in kind of a task sequence when when i uh, talk about osd operating system deployment i will show you how to create task sequences so we will create task sequences and in a task sequence we will give that okay first install the image then install the drivers then install uh, you know optional applications and if you if there are any other settings like install antivirus or any other things bitlocker encrypt the disk with bitlocker so all this you'll put in a task sequence and once you have the task sequence, it is just task sequence is just an XML file, okay? So once you have the task sequence ready, so every time you have a new machine to build, so if somebody asks, okay, or we have some 10 new users joining our company and we wanted you to build these 10 machines. So all you need to do is just connect all these 10 machines to network and run this task sequence, just one single click. So automatically these 10 machines will start building and it, they will get their respective drivers, the respective core applications and optional applications, right? So this kind of automation is possible through SSCM wherein your job is just make sure that the machines are connected online and then running this task sequence and after one hour the machines are ready. So it is not only saving your time, it is also uh, helping you that way. Wait a minute, Balu has just sent. Balu, what's the time now? It's 7.30, right? Wait a minute, let me unmute you. Balu, at what time you need to go to your office? Okay, you need to leave by eight o'clock. Fine, Balu. Um, I'll I'll be recording this. I'll be continue recording this session and I'll share it with you. So later, if you want to hear, you can hear to this session. Okay. Whenever you, uh, you want to leave, you can leave. So uh, that's how the uh, OSD part will help us. Right, guys? So let's move on to the, uh, the next one. Compliance management. So in compliance management, uh, hope you're... Uh, Manohar. Who is this? Yeah, Manju. Uh, man, uh, yeah. Actually, uh, this task sequence will come every uh, place, sir, only with the uh, OS deployment part. Uh, can you please uh, repeat your question, Manju? Uh, I mean to ask, this task sequence can be utilized in every place or only part of uh, OSD? So, most of the times we use it only for OSD and you can also use it for pushing softwares. Uh, it cannot be used for software updates or inventory or anything else but yes for if you want to push softwares say suppose you have 10 applications and you want to install these 10 applications one after the other yes you can still use task sequence for that okay so typically it is it is used uh, for osd for operating systems uh, but yes you can also do software okay any other questions no no okay okay Okay, so uh, coming to the next one, which is compliance management, um, I'll make it real quick. So, see, um, say suppose um, antivirus, okay? So you have some McAfee antivirus and it is on some version uh, 1.2.3, uh, right? And you know how antivirus definitions will keep on updating because as and when new viruses are coming, uh, your antivirus uh, product they will make sure that the product has the latest definitions updated so the latest versions are updated right say suppose if you are not updated with the latest uh, version so the chances of um, security breach are more right so what you will make sure is say suppose your leadership wants to make sure your customer wants to make sure that all the machines or at least 95 percent of the machines should have the latest version of mcafee antivirus right uh, if that is the requirement, right? how do you make sure that 95% of the machines have the latest updates or the latest version? So for that, what you can do is we have something called compliance management in SSCM. So what it will do, there are two things what SSCM can help you here. First thing is it will check for whatever setting you wanted it to check. Say suppose you want, you 
configure it in such a way that go and check on every machine what is the version of McAfee antivirus. Okay, it will just check and report back saying that okay, out of these machines I have checked some 10,000 machines. I see that some 8,000 machines have the latest updates, whereas another 2,000 machine are not on the latest version. Right, so that way it will tell you 80% of the machines are compliant and other machines are not compliant. Right, so it will just give you a report so that you can and now you have those 20 percent of machines or the 2000 machines which does not have uh, the latest update and you can take an appropriate action on them right that is one way uh, where SCM can help you the other way is if you know what is the appropriate action to be taken you can also configure in such a way that whenever a machine is found to be non-compliant right then immediately install xyz like maybe in this case install the latest version of uh, mcafee and make sure that the application is uh, having the latest version and make sure that it is compliant. So if you configure that way, what SCCM will help you is not only just reporting you back, it will also make sure that uh, all these 20% of the machines will get the latest version of McAfee and that way you are on 100% compliant, right? Any questions here? Manju, I see a hand raised here. Yeah, uh, actually just want to know uh, part of our compliance management uh, like uh, suppose say we have some thousand applications and uh, uh, for every application we need to con uh, there is any such uh, configuration we need to do uh, together at a time for all so that it will, it will check and uh, update us any of the applications are out of date or something like that or individually we'll, we will have an option to do uh, like that. See, basically in compliance management, um, you they, these are called as configuration items and configuration baselines. Okay, so what you can do is see one configuration item I just explained to you is antivirus. Similarly, you can create okay. any number of configuration items. So you can say, okay, a particular application needs to be on some, some version, or sometimes it is a registry value. On all the machines, the registry value should be one, a particular registry value. Okay, if it is found to be zero, again uh, change it back to one. Okay, so something like that. Uh, I, I can relate this to, for example, you have uh, a prevent USB, right? Prevent uh, USB drives. There is a registry for that. Mm -hmm. you, are, you are aware of that, right? Uh, come again, what, what is? So to prevent your USB sticks, so sometimes when you're trying to connect your pen drive to your laptop, the office laptop, it, uh -huh. it is blocked, right? Yeah, yeah. In, some, in some of the companies it is blocked. So how is that blocked? It is blocked by a registry file or a group policy, right? So what you can do yeah. is, if it says suppose if it is a registry file or a registry thing, you can make sure in compliance saying that check for this registry. If this registry value is one, uh, if user is uh, manually changing it to zero or whatever it is, again put it back to uh, the actual value one, right? So this is also a compliance. Any so this, it, it, mm -hmm. so this can be automated also, right? Yes, yes. So what you will do is, as part of SCCM, you will put all these different settings. You can create different con uh, configuration baselines, or in a single baseline, you can config. You will have ten different configuration items, right? You'll create all of them and say that okay, if any one of these is non-compliant, make it compliant. Or if any one of these is non-compliant, just report it. Give me a report saying that okay, these are the things which are non-compliant, right? So, so you can. You need to create it. So this will. Uh uh, we can do it for application, uh, not only application for OS also we can do. Yeah, so you can do it for application, you can do it for OS or you can do for, um, as I said, any registry file or a particular file version you can check for a, you can go to C windows, uh, there is a particular file and you want to check that file version. What is the file version? If the file version is so and so, only then the machine is compliant. So you can define any kind of rule here. And uh, I was uh, just reading a book or some, some article like uh, I heard that uh, from SCM uh, MDM devices also can be managed um, uh, so so this will check uh, for the MDM also. So if you are talking about mobile device management then we have something called Intune. Microsoft has something called Intune. So you need to use Intune mm -hmm. to uh, manage the mobile devices right and if you have Intune and SCM integrated together in your environment, you, if you have that kind of an infrastructure, yes, you can manage even mobile devices. Compliance. Okay. Intune is, in, uh, Intune is a part of uh, uh, Microsoft or uh, again different software? No, it's a Microsoft product. Intune is a Microsoft product, but uh, you need to, uh, but it, it is not a part of SCM. When you install SCM, it is not part of it. It's a separate product. Okay. So, so either, you can, either you can use Intune along with SCM or you can use Intune with Azure. 
Okay. So, okay. instead of having on, if you want uh, the Intune to be managed with SCM on premises, you will install and integrate with SCM. If you want it to manage from cloud, you will install Intune okay. with Azure and you can uh, manage your mobile devices. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, Manju, before I proceed? Uh, uh, no, no, no. Okay, perfect. So, finally, reporting. So we have discussed reporting is an interline concept in all of these. So whether you're doing inventory, collecting you know, hardware inventory or software inventory, whether you're deploying the softwares or the patches if you're deploying or if you're deploying operating systems, right? Or even the compliance management. In each of these, you definitely require reporting at every single stage about its failure, success, or uh, the information you wanted to get from database. So reporting is a crucial element here. So by default, SCCM comes with some 200 plus built-in reports. So for each of these, already there are reports. You don't need to create reports. They're already there. All you need to do is just run the report and uh, you'll have drop-down box, like well, what is the operating system you wanted to uh, get the report? What is for which application you want to uh, get the install or failure status? So such kind of drop-down list will be there. You just select the drop-down list and say view report. So some 200 plus reports are already there. But just in case, if you want to create your own reports, some custom reports, right? You need to know SSRS, uh, which is SQL uh, reporting services, right? So that SSRS and uh, report builder is also available uh, from SCCM. So what you can do is uh, towards the end of these sessions, I'll also help you in creating your own custom reports. I'll explain how to create your own reports, how to query SCM database. I'll explain a little bit on the SQL queries and the reports and basic reports, how to create them, right? So that is also part of these sessions. So I hope uh, the why SCCM part is clear. And I'm just, I'll just quickly go through the evolution. So as you can see, um, SMS actually, uh, I, as I told you, SCCM one, at one point of time, it used to be called as SMS, right? So as you can see, this entire thing started uh, way back in 94, 95. That's the time when it, it started. And initially, uh, systems management server, which is SMS 1.0, was primarily focused on inventory management. At that time, it did not have all these different features. It was just uh, inventory management. But uh, it used to be pathetic, very, very pathetic, very slow at that point of time. It, at one point, we used to call it as buggy SMS uh, till 1.2. That's how it used to be. Starting from, um, and 2.0 was released for Y2K. At that time, we had this Y2K issue, right? So in 99. So for Y2K remediation efforts, uh, 2.0 was released. But the biggest standard SMS which uh, which stood the version was SMS 2003. So if I have to relate that with operating systems like um, XP. So if you know, there were many other operating systems released by Microsoft, but Windows XP was there for quite a long time, right? So similarly, even SMS 2003 was there for quite a long time. Um, and uh, that, that was the biggest one which had even software distribution. Uh, it had operating system deployment. So all of the features, it was not just the inventory management. So that's the first time they have built in, they brought all these different capabilities. And later, uh, 2007 was there. Um, even that is there for a, quite a good time. So when it was during the time of Windows Vista and uh, Server 2008, so it started supporting the latest operating systems and that's 2007. And 2012, if you go now to any other company wherein you have SCCM, most of the companies would be using SCM 2012, right? There will be very few you'll find on SCM 2007 and none on SMS 2003. I don't think still there are any companies who are using SMS 2003. So very few you'll find on 2007 and most of them on 2012 or higher. So what is that released after 2012? So I, I will explain what is this application deployment capabilities. So as you can see here in 2012, uh, in this line item, I have mentioned like application deployment capabilities. And if you see in 2003, we have software distribution cap capabilities. So what's the difference be between a SMS 2003 software or package and SCCM 2012 application? We'll know when we talk about SCM 2012 application deployment sessions, right? When we get into the software deployment, I'll tell you what's the difference between the traditional applications, traditional packages, and what's the new applications, what are the new features we have. Um, we can also deploy the virtualized applications, AppV, right? So all those things we'll discuss. 
uh, what are the new features we have in 2012. So after 2012, what happened was uh, Microsoft started releasing, uh, instead of saying calling it as 2016 or uh, giving it any more year names, they started giving this new nomenclature. Um, so Manju or Rohit, do you are you aware of these numbers like 1511 or uh, you know SCM 1602? What does that mean? Do you have any idea? No, actually, I I was ready to ask you a question. <laughs> I have seen uh, uh, SCM uh, uh, 1702. Yeah. I've, uh, uh, actually, I was going through, through some articles, but I was seeing 1702. I could not understand, so I was ready to ask you a question, but you're uh, explaining the same. Yep, yep. So, uh, Manju, do you have any idea or you want me to explain? Yeah, you can explain. Ah, okay, okay. So, basically, it's very simple. So, what Microsoft did was after, not only for SCCM, even if you see your Windows 10 or going forward, any other thing, uh, Windows, any Windows release. So, what they're doing is, they're putting the year and the month in the version. So when they say 1511, it is basically November 2015. So now you know when this uh, operating system or when this particular Microsoft product has been released. So when you say 1602, it's actually February 2016. So it was supposed to release on February 2016, but it released on March. So still it is okay, 1602 or 1603. So that's the uh, year and the month. So now since uh, Sai you said 1702 right, so that was something which released in the February or March of 2017. Okay, sense? okay, yes. Okay. So, so that way it is easier now to identify for you which is the latest one. So tomorrow if somebody says okay I have uh, 1611 or 1702, you immediately you will understand okay he is talking about the latest version or the older version. Right. Okay. So Microsoft, uh, not only in uh, SCCM, even if you are talking about Windows 10, so they have this current branch, current branch for business, LTSB, long term servicing branch. So many things have changed. So going forward, you will not have a Windows 11, right? You will not have Windows 11 and Windows 12. It's only the Windows 10. After Windows 10, all you will be seeing is uh, these version numbers going forward. Okay. So what Microsoft has done after 2012, uh, Manju, okay, can you please uh, keep yourself on mute if you don't mind? Yeah, thank you. So what Microsoft has done is after um, SCM 2012, uh, they started giving all these different version numbers and versions as new features and they are just in console upgrades. When I say in console upgrades, so see, on the right hand side, as you can see, if you have SCM 2012 SP1, okay? Now, if you want to move to SP1 with Cumulative Update 1, so there is a patch. So when you install this patch, you can upgrade from SP1 to CU1. Similarly, if you want to upgrade from R2 SP1 to, or maybe if you want to upgrade from SP1 to R2 or R2 to R2 SP1, then there are individual patches are there, okay, for Cumulative Updates. But when you're moving from R2 to R2 SP1, so there is an upgrade guide. So what you need to do is you have to upgrade your entire SCCM. When I say entire SCCM, you will have uh, different um, hierarchies in SCCM, right? Uh, like the site, the boundaries. So you'll have a primary site, you have secondary site. So there are different sites. So how do you upgrade from one site to another site? So you, you need to make sure that all the components are upgraded. It's not just one server, all the other servers are upgraded. So it used to be a very tedious activity at one point of time. Now what they're doing is, starting from this new version numbers they have started. All you need to do is within SCCM console, you'll get an option to upgrade your system. So all you, when you click within the console, when you click that button, it will download the latest feature or the latest update and it will make sure that your entire SCCM infrastructure is upgraded. Maybe we, we are just by one click and after that, it will take a few hours for the entire, uh, all the servers to get upgraded. But there's no downtime as such and um, you don't need to first, uh, if, you, if, uh, if you ask me how we used to migrate from 2007 to 2012 or 2012 to the, uh, the R2 or SP1, we used to make sure that uh, each and every step is followed in a particular sequence. Like, first of all, you need to uh, stop few services, then you have to uh, copy few items from one, one place to other place. You have to take a backup of uh, different items. Then you run that uh, particular upgrade patch or, you know, uh, the latest version. Uh, so th there used to be a sequence of steps and if somewhere, if any one step fails, uh, the entire migration would have failed. So those were the days, but now there's nothing kind of such complex migration methods. All you need to make sure is you're on the baseline version of 1511. If you're on 1511, after that, if you want to upgrade to any latest version that Microsoft releases, so within the console, just click on that 
and it will automatically download the uh, latest update it will update the server and also it will also uh, give you one client agent so and it will update all these clients so wherever you have the SCCM uh, client agent all the client agents will get upgraded to the latest version and start communicating back to the server so all this will happen within few hours and there's no big migration uh, is required like from 2007 to 2012 or 2003 to 2007 such kind of migrations are not required uh, from 2012 and above right uh, Mana, yeah. I have a question here yeah go ahead uh, actually uh, uh, what is the major uh, the uh, difference between this SP and uh, R2 I just want to know uh, how we will be able to decide uh, what is the purpose of those uh, it's required that or not and uh, the second one uh, like R, if we are sitting in in real production area Mm, suppose think uh, we are uh, just we are SCM managed uh, managing people, mm -hmm. and are we are we free to uh, go ahead and uh, do a, a up, uh, for the console update which you are saying we will have an option to update, so uh, it will entirely update all these servers. So are we are we free to do that or again uh, we will have to check with some uh, like uh, some managers. Uh, Something like that, mm -hmm. or according to their instructions, only a specific instruction will come, and we will do it. Anything like that? Yeah, sure. I'll answer both of them. So uh, to answer the first question, um, like R2, SP1, and all that. So, see, uh, the uh, for most of the deployments, say suppose you want to support your Windows 10, right? So, or you have um, Server 2016. Right. So the moment you wanted to support the latest operating system machines, you have to keep on upgrading your SCCM. Like if you are on uh, 2012 uh, SP1 or if you are on just on 2012, you will not be able to manage uh, the Windows 8.1 at that point of time. So people used to migrate from 2012 uh, to R2 or SP1 to keep supporting the, the client machines. So if you are keep on upgrading your client machines or the server machines, Upgrading in the sense you are moving from 2003 servers to 2008 and 2008 to 2012 servers or 2012 to 2016 servers. So when you're updating your fleet, right, you have to keep on updating your SCCM because if SCCM has to manage the latest operating systems and uh, latest features, it it has to be updated uh, to to be able to support them. So that's one reason why you keep on upgrading from R2 to SP1 or even uh, from, you know, R2 SP1 is already, uh, it's kind of a baseline now. Everybody will have SSCM 2012 R2 SP1. That's a kind of a baseline. So on top of it, you will be upgrading to 1511 and all this. Now, coming to your second question, which is like, are we free to keep on upgrading whenever a new upgrade comes? No, you're not free to do that because there is still a change management and uh, your uh, management will de decide and define and tell you okay uh, this is when we wanted to move to the latest version say suppose microsoft already released 1702 right but even though microsoft released 1702 typically any company would prefer to wait for four months or six months down the line to make sure that there are no issues with that particular uh, recent version released by microsoft and because if there are any issues microsoft would release some hot fixes or maybe another version of uh, sccm Right, so people would prefer uh, to see a particular version more stable before adopting it in your own environment. So your managers, or uh, you know, if you are the uh, decision maker, if you are the SCCM lead and you are the decision maker, you would prefer to wait for uh, four months down the line, and after that, maybe in in the month of August, you can go ahead and then uh, take a change management approval, saying that okay, we are upgrading our SCCM servers uh, to 1702. Uh, take that approval and then yes, you can, why not? Then you can uh, start uh, upgrading from the within the console. So you, you still need to follow your IT process, whatever you have. All I was trying to tell you is, initially when you're doing migration, it is a big task. Like you need to take a downtime and over the weekend you have to come and work for uh, maybe, you know, to, to the entire Saturday and Sunday you need to work and make sure that all the distribution points, all the management points, all the different primary sites, secondary sites, wherever you have, make sure that each and every server is upgraded to that latest version. Now it's not that complex. That is what I was trying to tell you. Manju, did I answer your questions? Uh, yes. And uh, this R2 means uh, what it is, a release or? Uh... Yes, R2 is the release, release thing uh, is, it is. Uh, so, okay. uh, see, if you see the right side, you have the build version, right? Um, wait a minute, I'll tell you. 
can you see the build version here 1000 yes yeah. 7958 and 1000 right and after mm -hmm. that if you see r2 sp1 it is again the same build version of um, uh, the thousand, but however, the the major version, which is seven eight zero four, wait a minute, seven nine five eight, has been changed to eight two three nine, right? So it it is it is just the same release uh, what's happening, but with some more add-on features. So with every uh, SP one, every cumulative update, uh, SSM will be keep on uh, giving more support to the operating system, more support to new features. So that's all. It is only feature updates what you will see from. R2 to R2 SP1, R2 SP1 to CU2 or CU3. Every time, most of the times, it's uh, it's the feature update, and sometimes it is bug fixing. If there are any bugs, okay. it is sometimes it is bug fixing. Yeah. Okay. So let's move ahead. So it is just the extension of the same thing. So as you asked me, so as you can see, 15.11 was released in December. Uh, so uh, as you can see it is supposed to release in the month of November. So that's the reason 15 December you have that 15 11 thing then 1602 March you have that 1602 1606 in July 1610 in November and then 1702 in March Right, so that's how uh, these are released and as you can see every time they release any new um, updates in between uh, each of these current branches you can see uh, why they are released. For example, here it says can't create, edit, or delete rules for a compliance policy in SCM version 1606 that has been fixed with this particular patch, right? So this is where currently we are on, on 23rd March. So this is the latest one, 1702. So in our uh, sessions, in our class, what I'll do is I'll first explain uh, how to install SCM 2012 R2 SP1, right? And we to towards the end of the session. So at the entire sessions, we'll learn on SCM 2012 R2 SP1 because that is the most prevalent uh, SCM version being used by many of the companies. So even if you get a job in any other company as a SCM administrator, most probably they will be on the SCM 2012 R2 SP1. So first of all, since that is the baseline, I would want you to learn the uh, the software distribution or whatever the all the other features on that particular platform. And then, there will be an add-on features or add-on things when you upgrade to the latest version 1702. So I'll uh, towards the end of the session, I'll explain how to migrate from this particular version to 1702. So I'll show within the console how you migrate from older version to the latest version. Then you get some add-on capabilities like ma managing from the cloud or some pull distribution point, cloud distribution point. So those are the add-on things which you'll get by updating to the latest versions. So that we'll uh, discuss towards the end of the sessions. Okay. So guys um, this being the demo so if you are um, fine I can continue for another 30 minutes so we have till 8 30 so I can explain about the SCM components or if you want to take a break for today because this is just an overview and start from tomorrow from these SCM components I'm fine with that Sai and Manju you prefer to continue till 8 30 or you want me to stop it here anything is okay uh, from my side uh, what about Manju? So basically I'm starting with SCCM like what is a site, what is a boundary, what is boundary groups. So I'm going to start the actual um, SCCM basic stuff, right? So I thought of if you want to listen it with fresh mind tomorrow morning because till now we talked about why SCCM and all other stuff, right? You want to or you want me to continue for another 30 minutes, I can continue and close it off. Or else you want me to start with these concepts tomorrow morning, I'm fine with that. It's totally up to you. Yeah, then tomorrow if you are starting this, uh, what, uh, only this topic will be covered or anything extra will be covered? No, there will be extra as well. Uh, mm. We'll talk about uh, all the uh, different components as well. I'll go to the day day two topics. So day one co concepts, so currently I have, uh, uh, let me show it to you what I have here with so I'll just explain about site, boundary, boundary group, client agent, site database, console, and then the hierarchy, right? So this is what I wanted to explain uh, as the components. And once this is done, so tomorrow I'll pick it up from inventory management, uh, the, the very initial thing like installing the site, installing the lab. So we'll start from the basics. So you want me to explain on the components today or uh, components uh, you want me to explain? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, about introduction of a component, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, then you can. Then I can what? I can continue or I can? Yeah, you can. You, you can, you can. 
ओके 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 थैंक्स मंजू देयर इज लॉट ऑफ डिस्टरबेंस सो आई आई कुडंट एबल टू हियर यू प्रॉपर्ली फाइन ओके गाइस सो लेट्स स्टार्ट विद एससीएम साइट सो बिफोर आई गेट इनटू द साइट कैन एनी वन ऑफ यू टेल मी व्हाट इज द डोमेन इन एक्टिव डायरेक्टरी व्हाट इज द डोमेन and to mine is where uh, we can uh, manage and uh, uh, see our uh, client systems and also the group policies um, the total environment will be under the domain controller okay okay so i am not clear but uh, no no, no. i i was not expect i was not expecting any bookish definition so this is what even i have expected from you so yes so domain is basically a uh, kind of um, uh, networking of different machines right you are joining all these machines and as you said uh, to manage all these machines from a centralized domain controller or to authenticate user access right um, so if a user is trying to log into a domain with his username and password there should be a standard domain controller which will authenticate him with respect to his username and password and allow him to access the resources in the domain right uh, so that is basically a domain right so similarly even in ccm world we have something called site we call it as site so in site what will happen is so all these different client machines that you have you will be managing from a site from a single site okay so just like you have a domain controller there here you will have something called management point okay so within a site so uh, let me uh, take you completely out of this technical world and uh, go into a layman example so that you would understand better so uh, in a country like india right so i'm just going out of the technical world so if you have uh, if you are talking about country like india so we have uh, different um, states and then we have uh, uh, people uh, of different uh, who speak different languages and all and then how are they managed how are they governed so we have state governments we have then central government and then we have different portfolios and for each portfolio we have a minister like uh, education minister health minister and right and then we have a prime minister and we have a president right so when you have people from different states speaking different languages so how you are managing them is first of all you are creating the, you have different states and then you have a central government and at the state government you have uh, different portfolios portfolio managers and then at central government again you have different portfolios portfolio managers right portfolio ministers and that's how they are managing uh, they governing us right similarly and then how you are saying that this is india you are saying this is india based on boundaries you have certain boundaries saying that okay this is my region this is my state this is my country right you have boundaries for that that's how you are defining it right so here also in a site what will happen is it it is first of all a region where all these client machines are uh, connected to and managed then you have different portfolios so when you have say different portfolios like just like education and uh, health minister how i was telling there here also if you want to manage the client machines to get the inventory okay you need to have one server if you want to distribute softwares you need to have one server if you want to distribute software updates you need to have a different server if you want to run reports you need to have a different server if you want to uh, capture their user data during migration you want to capture their user data and restore it back after the migration is done like from windows xp to windows 10 you are migrating so during windows xp all the data needs to be captured and put it on the server all the user data like his my documents and everything and after you migrate him to windows 10 you want to restore that data back from the server to his client machine right so for that you need a state migration point like that for each and every activity you require a server right like you require you have a portfolio minister for each and every activity here also for each and everything you have a server similarly even if i talk about domains in domain also you have like domain controller and then you have dhcp uh, whose duty is only to release ip addresses dns whose duty is only to resolve names to ip and ips to name right so like that web server its duty is to host the uh, websites similarly here also for each and act, uh, every activity you have different servers so here in ssm world we call them as point so when i say management point it is nothing but a management server distribution point is a distribution server okay don't confuse with the name point point is nothing but a server now so how do we define here that this is my country this is my state you have boundaries so similarly in ssm what will what you can do is you can create boundaries uh, with respect to ip addresses you can say okay if the ip address range 
is from 10 dot x dot x dot x to uh, 10 dot y dot y dot y then this is my site so any client machine which is within this IP address range you need to consider that as uh, my member and I'm going to govern that right so that way you can create based on IP address range you can create based on IP subnets or active directory sites or even with IPv6 if you're not using IPv4 if you're using IPv6 using IPv6 prefix and suffix you can still uh, define these boundaries okay so when we get into actually I will also help you in creating this site we will create boundaries we will create boundary groups so physically on the console I will show you all of this so don't worry this is just to give you an idea that there is something called boundaries existing okay now say suppose you have you have defined that you are your country and then you have defined that uh, these are my boundaries now how do you know uh, the details of each individual each citizen of India so you have some kind of Aadhaar card or some kind of you know government issued cards right based on that card you will have his information his biometrics his uh, house address or his telephone number so such kind of information is already there with government and based on that they are uh, if they want to um, introduce some government policy and they wanted to uh, make sure that uh, you get that policy so for that what they are doing is they are first taking uh, trying to understand uh, what's your economical status or uh, you know different things based on that they will give some subsidies to you and all that right so for that they need to have uh, you need to have some identity number right so similarly here also in SCCM when you want to manage each of these machines each machine will have a client agent a agent is installed on each of these machines Okay, agent is nothing but it's small application which sits in your system tray just like your uh, near your clock and time you'll have in the system tray you'll have a small agent there you can also check it from the control panel and within that agent uh, what it will do is it will keep on communicating with the server saying that okay um, every you can define that every 60 minutes so every 60 minutes it will be communicating with your server saying that okay so these are the changes happening uh, on this client machine and keep update you can keep updating this to the server and getting uh, you can get that information back from the server as well uh, Manor, uh this client agent is it uh, only applicable is it only application which uh, be installed in the on the client machines or along with the application it, it, it is also require any uh, dependency of a service to be enabled or started so what will happen is it's, it's a uh, very good question so what what happens is the moment uh, you want to manage these machines uh, and you create your boundaries so you will um, push these clients from the console itself you don't install it manually from each and every single machine so from the console uh, you'll say that okay I want to manage these 500 machines so install client agent so what will happen as part of the process of installing client agent it will also install a service called SMS agent host service so a service is also installed and it will make sure that the service is up and running okay so as long as the service is up and running so the service will make sure that this agent continuously talks to the server and sends back the inventory or all that other stuff yeah so it's SMS host service is it? SMS agent host service. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, client agent and okay now say suppose you have a client agent and all this information is getting gathered so where do you store it? So in the back end you will have a site database okay. So the SQL what I was telling you earlier so you will have a SQL database wherein you will have so many tables so many views uh, wherein uh, it will talk about each and every individual component like uh, you will have a table only for operating system information of all these machines you will have a table only for the uh, NIC cards you will have one more table only to get the information on your uh, logical disks right like that for each and every individual item you will have uh, tables uh, in the SQL database and all this information which is collected from the client agent uh, like you will have uh, some something which you will be running every 60 minutes something will be running periodically like every once in a week there are a few things which will run uh, once in a day so like that there are different cycles of uh, information is gathered at different intervals and all this uh, information is sent back to the SSCM server to the management point management point is the main server which talks to the client machine right just like domain controller here we call it as management point so management point is the main service talks to the client machine gets all this inventory data and puts it on the back end in the database right now you have a site you have a boundary defined you have the client agents you have information on the database now how do you access this information from the database you cannot always get into the database and uh, keep on writing queries and get that information right there should be an interface for that so that interface is SCCM console 
So in the SCCM console, what will happen? It will. It is nothing but it's an interface to the database, and whatever. Uh, Manar, uh, sorry, I just uh, understood the site database. Can you please one thing? Sure. So site database, so what will happen is as part of uh, these client agents, right? So client agents are installed on the client machines, right? And what do they do? The client machine, the client agents. So for example, if I have something like hardware inventory and if I have configured this hardware inventory to run once in a week. So what it will do every week, it will be keep on getting all this information like what is the current status of the logical disk, uh, disk space and what is the uh, RAM, what is other 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 things, right? All these different hardware inventory information is captured once in a week. Similarly, uh, once in a week, you might have configured to run the software, like how many softwares are installed, at what point of uh, time the software is installed, when is it uninstalled, so all that information. Similarly, you have pushed the software uh, uh, and the software failed with a particular error. Okay, that information and software updates. So how many patches have been installed? How many are required for this machine, but how many are installed? So all this kind of information is periodically taken through different cycles of, uh, you know, intervals. And this information is captured by the client agent and sent to the management point. All right. This management point will in turn write this information in the background site database on the SQL server, right? So in that site database, you'll have individual tables for each and every entry. So all this information which is captured is uh, completely written onto the site database, right? So the management point here, it is just like your domain controller, which actually talks to each of each and every client uh, end user machine. Here management points talks to the client agents. It will take this information, put it in the database. Is it clear, uh, Manju? Uh, yeah, it's clear. And uh, this can be uh, whenever we require uh, uh, it can be pulled right and uh, from where uh, we can pull this report details. Yeah, yeah. so th th that's what I was trying to tell you by the fifth point. So basically what happens is this database, if you have it in uh, the site database, either you can write your own queries in the SQL Management Studio or you can pull from the reports, which are, as I told you earlier, there are some 200 plus reports within the SCCM console. So you can run those reports and get this information. And apart from that, what I was trying to tell you is the SCCM console. So when you have all this information in database, there should be an interface to get uh, not only to read the database, even to write to the database. If you want to write, it's not only from the client agents you are writing. Even from the server, you need to write few things. Like for example, you are saying that I want to install Adobe Reader to uh, find it machines. So this is an activity which you will do on the console and backend, whatever the action that you do, accordingly, some things will be written in the database, right? and a policy will be created and the policy will make sure that uh, this Adobe Reader is getting pushed to the database, uh, sorry, uh, being pushed to those 500 machines and this information is written in the database. So anything which you're making any changes, any transactions that you're doing on console is written in the database. Similarly, once the transaction is completed, whatever is the effect of the transaction that the application is installed successfully or failed or uh, whatever the information that is again captured as part of inventory and sent back and written on the database. So every transaction that you are making is there on the database and can be managed from a single point called console. So console is nothing but a uh, GUI. It's an interface for you wherein you can create computers just like your, Adri, Adri, um, your Active Directory computers and users. So here also you'll have a console wherein you create collections, you create software, software updates. So that's the main area where the SCCM admins will be working on. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now let's move on to the site servers. So basically here you have three kinds of site servers, CAS, primary site and secondary site. So if, you, if I have to start with one, I would say if you are just having a, you know, some thousand machines and you just wanted to install SSM for them. So the first thing you'll start with is primary site. So the very first site you build, is called as primary site. So if you remember in uh, Active Directory as well, when you are creating a domain, the very first domain you create, it is itself a domain, it itself is a forest, right? So because that's the first domain that you're creating. Similarly here also, the very first site you build using SCCM, when you install it, it is called as primary site. It's a standalone primary site. So if you think uh, you need only uh, to manage some 10,000 machines or one lakh machines, okay? You can just install one primary site which will help you in uh, managing those machines. Say suppose if you have multiple locations, 
right you have uh, I, I let me take you to the next slide i think i have a hierarchy here yeah see for example you your company's head office is in houston okay so then you can just create one primary site for in houston to manage all the devices in houston say suppose your presence is only in houston and nowhere else so you'll just create one primary site in houston and that is called as standalone site standalone primary site now say suppose you have offices even in seattle and boston right so in that case what you'll do is you'll have a primary site in houston whereas you since you have branch offices you will have secondary sites at seattle and boston right so when i say secondary sites secondary sites cannot manage more machines right so suppose if you're managing like 5000 machines so less than that okay it's fine having a um, secondary site there and if the machines are very less than 500 if it is less than 500 if you have only 40 machines in a branch office there's no point in even creating a secondary site there the primary site can still talk to those machines and still can get that information so basically why you create a secondary site there is um, i'll give you a normal example for example um, hyderabad is the main office okay bangalore is a branch office and chennai is a branch office now if there is a client machine which is in chennai and if it has to talk to the main server which is in hyderabad over uh, over the van right so over internet or over van when it is communicating to a server which is in hyderabad and i told you that there are some cycles which will run every uh, one hour there are some cycles which run every uh, you know uh, every single day or every week so if all these machines are continuously talking to the server there will be a lot of bandwidth will, which will be consumed right so to avoid that what we'll do is we'll create one more server and uh, call it a secondary site and we'll put that server in chennai itself or we'll put one more server in uh, bangalore so that the client machines will directly come and talk to the bangalore server over lan and there is no not much of bandwidth consumption right but say suppose if you have just 40 machines or 50 machines it doesn't make any sense to create a secondary site there let those 40 50 machines talk to the uh, main server which is in hyderabad right makes sense so only when there are at least 500 or more devices you'll go with a secondary site right now what is the uh, necessity of a central administration site or the cas site what is the requirement of torrento site so what will happen is see basically this torrento site will not manage the clients it will not talk to the clients or anything but say suppose as i told you houston is the primary site and you have seattle and boston as secondary site similarly in uk uh, maybe London is your uh, main primary site and Manchester you have the secondary site and similarly in the Asia Pacific region you have Shanghai primary site now if there is a specific uh, client machine okay which is in Houston right how do you know uh, the machine which is in Houston okay and uh, what is the hardware inventory information about that machine in somebody who is sitting in Shanghai right so when there is a site to site replication you want to get any information from another site to this site then you need to have a CAS here. CAS will is the only server which will take all the information from different sites and then delivers that to the other sites. So it is only an information gatherer, gatherer and uh, provider from sites. So it is only a site to site replication what it would. It is never talking to the client machines. So under Seattle you might be having some thousand machines here, under Boston you have some thousand machines here, under Houston you have some one lakh machines. It is not talking to the client machines, it is not managing those it is just talking to the site database of Houston and uh, giving that information back to Shanghai or to London. Make sense? Any questions here? Uh, on this side. Yes, sir. Uh, so Houston, okay. Uh, Tivo R, that does not have any database, right? It's only a connection between the both uh, sites. No, no, no. It has database, but however, it is not communicating to the client machines. It will not be talking to the client machines. Like there will not be any management point which will be talking to the client machines. Or uh, you cannot uh, distribute any software from Toronto site. You cannot do operating system deployment from Toronto site. It is only a site which will do a site to site replication. It will definitely have a database in the background, but uh, it is a server and it has site database. It is not managing the client machine. That's the only difference. Okay, uh, but in some of the article I've uh, studied that the secondary site does not have access to the database only the primary site has an access to the database is it true that used to be the case but uh, now uh, even on the secondary site also uh, you you need to have a SQL database 
that used to be the case so i'll tell you what initially um, so even uh, i think in sim 2007 yeah in sim 2007 days what we used to do is like on the secondary side on the secondary side server instead of uh, having a secondary side server we can have um, uh, distribution points okay but what will happen is uh, if if i have to get into the technical details there is something called bandwidth throttling okay uh, if you are trying to push a particular software okay and distribute it to some 1000 machines which are which are in boston instead of secondary side if you have a distribution point there what will happen is it will not have a control over bandwidth that means all those 1000 machines will straight away start downloading the the software from the boston server and thereby it will uh, consume your bandwidth so what they have done is starting from 2012 and above they have kept the distribution point itself they have given a new capability called bandwidth throttling right so it can define saying that only 20% of bandwidth you need to use or 50% of bandwidth you can use or only in the peak hours uh, in the peak hours you can use only 10% of the bandwidth non peak hours after the office hours you can use 100% of the bandwidth like that you can throttle the bandwidth in the distribution points so once this started since distribution itself has that bandwidth throttling capability people have actually stopped using the secondary sites nowadays you don't need the secondary site concept though it is still the concept is still there you can still install secondary site with sql server but this concept itself is not required okay so most of the times you can just go with a standalone primary uh, does it answer your question uh, sai yes yes okay so most of the times uh, you can just go with the primary site and when i talk about the cast uh, point here if i have to tell you uh, maybe in the next slide when we when you uh, see the numbers you will understand better but uh, just to give you an overview uh, in my last 10 years of uh, experience in with sccm i've seen like uh, clients with uh, 1 lakh client machines or 1 lakh 50000 client machines there are different banks which has like uh, 3 lakhs or even 4 4 lakhs client machines and none of them had moved with uh, a cast server everything can be still managed from a single primary server for so single pri primary like a standalone primary is more than enough you don't need a cas server all the times so there are certain reasons why we move to uh, cas server so most of the times what microsoft is trying to discourage or what microsoft is trying to make a statement here is wherever possible just go with standalone primary site standalone primary site is more than enough only in the case where you want to go with uh, you know multiple uh, locations uh, you need to go with multiple primary sites and then you'll go with multiple secondary sites and then you only in that case you require a cache site so if you have just one single primary site you don't require a cache site on top of it make sense so yeah. yeah so yes so basically what they're trying to tell you here is maintain a flat structure don't go with a hierarchy like first cache then primary and secondary that is not required now it is all the capabilities are included in the distribution point in the primary site itself so that you don't need to have multiple primaries and multiple caches or you know not multiple caches though a single cache and multiple primaries and multiple secondaries right so let me take you to the next slide with those numbers i think you would understand what i'm trying to say here see for every cache server you can have 25 child primary sites okay that means when we are talking about 25 child primary sites already each primary site is like uh, one primary site is enough to manage entire us america and one primary site is enough to manage the entire emea region and one is enough to manage asia pacific so think about if each cache can manage 25 child primary sites how many companies would require uh you know those many primary sites not not many very few would require uh, 25 child primary sites right and each primary site can have 250 secondary sites right and when i get into secondary site versus distribution point this i have already explained to you like if you have less than 500 clients just go with a distribution point you don't need a secondary site also right if you have more than 500 clients yes maybe you can think of it wait a minute uh, did i yeah so management points so in each primary site you can have 10 management points and each secondary site will have one management point at max this is the maximum that you can have in a primary server primary site so management point what is management point 
So management point is nothing but it is the one server which is talking to the client machines, right? So in a primary set, we are saying we will have 10 management points. Why do you need 10 management points for load sharing? So say suppose you have one lakh client machines, okay? And if you have just one management point, so and you know management points work is only to talk to the client machines. So every time if they, it is keep on sending inventory, how can man, one single management point can take care of all these one lakh clients, right? So in such cases, what you will do is you'll have more and more management points in the same server, in the same uh, primary site, you'll create multiple servers with management point role. If you want to relate it to something like uh, your domain, so I can explain this. So in a domain, you can have multiple domain controllers, right? So it is similar concept. So for load sharing, you create multiple domain controllers. Similarly, in a primary site, you can create multiple management points. That is maximum up to 10 you can create. And in a secondary site, you can create maximum up to one. And even that one should be on the secondary site server itself. It should be on the secondary site server itself. You have to create a management point. You cannot create a management point on a different server when it comes to secondary site. Don't worry. This is just the initial class. If you're, if something is, if you're not able to understand something, don't worry about it. As you see the actual server, as you create management points, you'll understand in much detail. So never ever get stopped uh, by just um, few doubts. If you have any doubt, just please speak out now itself. I will explain. But still, if there is something which is um, uh, you're not getting uh, a proper understanding right now, don't worry about it. Slowly, when we actually do the practicals, you'll understand in detail. So regarding distribution points, so you can have uh, 250 distribution points um, per primary or secondary, and you can have 2000 additional DPs. So I'll explain what a pull DP is. So going forward in the next sessions, we will talk about pull DPs. And each distribution point can uh, communicate up to 4000 clients. Okay, what is a distribution point? It is a server which will help to distribute the softwares, right? So when you want to distribute some, uh, as we'll go back by the same example like Adobe Reader, okay? When you want to distribute Adobe Reader to some 5,000 clients, so basically what you will do is, if you have all those uh, 4,000 clients, if you have in Hyderabad and you have 1,000 clients in uh, Mumbai, so for these 4,000 clients in Hyderabad, you'll create one distribution point, and in Mumbai, you'll have one more distribution point, right? So in each location, a particular distribution point can take care up to 4,000 clients. Say suppose in Hyderabad, you have 8,000 clients or 6,000 clients, one distribution point can take cannot take care of it. So in Hyderabad itself, you'll create two distribution points because you have more than 4,000 clients there, right? In the, uh, uh, yeah. Manohar, uh, yes, see, uh, you just said uh, distribution point is a server. Yes. It's not a server, no, it's just an, Mm, application where we can uh, I'm not sure I'm just asking you yeah, uh, distribution yeah, point distribution point is is a separate server yes it is a server so what we are doing is say for example yeah. um, think about um, uh, give me any five application names mm -hmm. okay SAP, SAP, SAP Okay, Firefox is there. Okay, SAP is there, AutoCAD is there. Okay, Google Chrome is there, Skype is there, right? Now these are five applications. Now these five applications, each one of them needs to be downloaded from different websites, right? They have different vendor websites, right? You download from different websites. Now, you have to, you, your packager, as I told you initially in the application package, what he will do, he will create a package out of it. He creates an MSI, MST, and he will give you the final version saying that, okay, if you install this MSI, it will install that package and all the settings that your customer wants, right? Now you have the MSS, MSTs ready with you. Now what you'll do is, you will first see how many users require it. You will tell that, okay, there are few users who require it in Hyderabad, there are few in Mumbai, there are few in Delhi, right? Now what you'll do is, if you, you have to stage this somewhere. You have to keep these five server, five applications on a particular server so that the client machines can start downloading from that server, right? So that server is distribution point. So what you'll tell, okay, since I have few machines in Delhi, so if there is, is there a distribution point in Delhi? Yes, there is a distribution point in Delhi. So distribute this application, five applications to Delhi. Maybe in Hyderabad, they require only Skype. Okay, distribute only uh, Skype and not the other four applications, only Skype to Hyderabad DP and distribute the other four applications to Mumbai DP, right? Now you distribute. So where are you distributing them? You're actually staging them on a server. So a local server in that location. In Mumbai, there is a local server. So in every location, you're copying this entire content, the MSIs, the command line, everything onto a server. Now what will happen when you are pushing it to the client machine, the client agent will talk to the management point. 
it will say that okay uh, i want adobe reader it will say that okay if you want adobe reader go to the uh, server distribution point which is within mumbai go and talk to it so it will give the distribution point ip address then this client management point, uh, client uh, agent will talk to the local distribution point which is another server right in uh, mumbai or delhi which is local to it and it will ask okay do you have adobe reader with you it says yes i do have adobe reader and uh, here is the uh, msi here is the command line so it will download from there and start installing on that particular client machine so distribution point is nothing but you can consider it as a uh, file share a shared file share server right file server wherein you have all these uh, application binaries copied over there so that the client machines can directly download from there make sense and uh, here uh, you mean to say if you want to install or push or anything we want to deploy any of the software it may be one or more than uh, then uh, first we will have to create distribution point is it so distribution point is based is is your foundation so by default it's not just for one application you are pushing that if you have machines in hyderabad today or tomorrow you need to push this software right so you will have a distribution point by default you will create a distribution point based on a location so it is not because of a software you are not creating distribution point because you have some 1000 machines there you are creating a distribution point there right so it is as part of your basic infrastructure like for example um, see i i'll make uh, okay you have you want what is the use of dhcp server it gives ip addresses right it releases ip addresses now if you have some 10 machines just because to give ip addresses to 10 machines will you create a dhcp server that's not the point here since it's a branch office in mumbai you will create a dhcp server there and tomorrow it could be 10 machines it could be 100 or 1000 machines so as and when it expands that same dhcp server will will be helpful for all those client machines right similarly if in mumbai you have 1000 machines you will create a dp there whether it requires one software or 100 softwares you will have a dp there and slowly as and when you get more and more softwares you will be distributing them to that particular dp and that's how it happens so okay i'll give you another example say suppose you have only 50 machines in uh, goa okay you have just 50 machines in goa now can i uh, sh should i create a dp here or not what will happen if i don't create a dp so if you don't create a dp these 50 machines they will say talk to the management point saying that okay i need um, skype software i need to install skype software then management point will tell okay wait a minute i see that there is no dp in goa so let me check what is the nearest dp to you it will say okay the nearest dp is bombay so in bombay you have a dp go ahead and uh, download from dp bombay dp now this will the, all these 50 machines will talk to bombay dp and start downloading the skype software and install it so it's it doesn't harm because it's just 50 machines talking to a bombay dp over van say suppose if you have 500 machines even if it is a one software like skype but all these 500 machines are talking to a bombay dp then it is definitely a concern right bandwidth is con getting consumed so keeping that in mind to save the bandwidth you need to have even if it is single software you need to have a dp in at each and every location if you have more number of machines make sense uh, manju mm -hmm. like uh... The examples are all maybe uh, in detail, but a uh, little bit hard of confusion. <laughs> maybe uh, I think if I see, then maybe while mm -hmm. in the navigator. Sure, sure, sure. You'll understand and, much better and, when we get in detail. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and this uh, full DPs, uh, what what it mean? Uh, like uh, five thousand DPs. Yeah. DPs under DPs. Yeah, that's what that's what as I told you. Uh, I would prefer to keep it um, in the actual distribution point sessions in in those classes because because now for you to understand DP, it will take time. Uh, it will take some time to understand the actual what DP will will do. When I actually show you on software distribution, you'll understand the DP's role. So if I have to take you to pull DP first, you need to understand what a DP would do. Then you'll understand the beauty of pull DP. How pull DP is actually saving bandwidth. You'll understand that. So I'll keep it for. Uh, keep it for the software deployment session. Is that okay? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, just uh, overall, I was trying to understand uh, mm -hmm. what actually in which exact exact scenario this uh, DP is uh, required, and maybe it is uh, must and should uh, required, or uh, maybe like uh, I mean, just want to understand the dependency of a DP. Dependency? Uh, okay, uh, dependency of a DP or dependency of a pull DP? I mean, both are different, is it? Yeah, both are different. DPs are different and pull DPs are different. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll just tell you the dependency of DP. So the dependency of DP is, see, what is the main work of SCM? What does SCM will do? It is a courier boy, right? What it does is, SCM is basically sending packages from one location to another location to the end user client machine, right? It could be software, it could be patches, it could be operating system image, or it could be uh, even gathering inventory. So anything, it is a courier boy. It is a, either sending you from here to there or from there to here, right? Yeah. Now, when you are trying to push any software, that is a predominantly SSM will be used for software distribution. I have seen in most of my uh, clients, uh, customers, there will be at least 5,000 to 10,000 applications, okay? So by default, you'll not see, uh, you'll not understand why why we need 5,000 or 10,000 applications. But actually, when you see the SSM infrastructure, you'll understand there will be at least 5,000 to 10,000 applications. Now, how are you going to distribute these 5,000 to 10,000 applications to each end user machine as and when they require it, whenever they ask it? So that makes DP as a mandatory component. So distribution point is definitely a mandatory component. It's not an optional thing to decide whether it is required or not. But the only point here to to look for the thumb rule here is if you have less number of machines, very low number of machines in a particular location, then instead of having a DP in that location, maybe you can make sure that the nearest DP, uh, like as I said, Goa and uh, Bombay. So you can make sure that the nearest DP is communicating to these machines, 50 machines. When the machines are very less, you don't need to create a DP there, right? But DP is anyways mandatory. You need a DP for your entire site's site. You need definitely need uh, DPs. But again, only on a very individual branch, if you're thinking, okay, in individual branch, you can make a decision. Okay, yeah, I need a DP here. No, I don't need a DP here. Maybe I can create in a remote location. I can create in a uh, bigger metropolitan city, which is nearby, right? That's how you can take a decision based on the number of client machines. Uh, does it make any sense to you, Manju? <coughs> Uh, yeah, I had a little bit understood, but still have a confusion. So uh, can, can you can you put it across? Or uh, Sai, is is that the same uh, case with you as well? Uh, I am clear. Um, no problem. Okay, okay. So, uh, Manju, please please go ahead. Uh, you are asking something. Yeah. Uh, so, let me make it a little bit more easier. Uh, my like, if if I have only one client. If I need a, a hundred of application or maybe one application, if yeah, let me separate it. Uh, if I have one client, one machine, which is located in one place, and uh, some uh, kind of a request comes for one application, so in that situation, a DP refer or not refer? That's what I'm saying. See, first of all, the kind of scenario that you're saying in real time is not possible like you'll not have seen one client in one branch office right say suppose you have some 10 clients or 50 clients so what i'm trying to say here is if you have at least like uh, at least like when we are doing testing okay so definitely you require a dp because how are you going to distribute to that one client machine if you if you have a software with you right the software has to be stays somewhere it stays somewhere before the client machine can download it if not from a uh, local if not from a local yeah, device, it has to go to some remote DP or somewhere, but it has to go to some server to download that software. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay. Uh, this was uh, actually as, uh, trying to get it under clarity. Uh, so no problem. no problem. I'm happy that you got, got it clarified. Okay. So, uh, where are we? Yeah. So, maximum, uh, we, it can take up to 4,000 clients. Right, and then uh, 10,000 packages and applications are the maximum. So, uh, what what I'll do is I'll uh, uh, again discuss on these distribution points as part of the software distribution classes. Then you'll understand this pull DPs and all. This is just to give you an overview, like how many management points can be managed. This is a capacity planning kind of thing, right? And here we are with our um, software update point. So, if you have the software update point, it can manage up to 25,000 clients, and um, if you if it is on a remote server if you have software update point so software update point again i'll discuss on that software update point is is the server which is required to push the patches just like distribution point is to push the softwares software update point is to push the patches now, right so if you want to manage uh, if you want to push patches yes definitely you require software update point even if you have a single client machine and that single client machine require patches yes you require one sup only then it will be able to download the patches and install it 
right? So if you have that software update point created on the same site server, so if you have a primary site server and the same site server, if you are creating software update point, it can manage only up to 25,000 because of the performance. There will be an effect on performance because it is the site server and the same site server, if you are installing SUP, there will be a performance problem. So it can only handle 25,000 clients. But if you have it on a different server, so site server is different and you have SUP so dedicated on a different server, then it can take care up to 1,50,000 clients. When I say it can take care, it can distribute patches up to 1,50,000 clients, right? So these, these are the quick numbers. So CAS, the central administration site, can take care up to 6, uh, six lakh uh, client machines when it is on data center or enterprise edition of SQL Server. If it is on standard edition, it can take care up to 50,000. Standalone primary site can take care up to 1,50,000 clients. So if, when you have 1,50,000 client machines, so very few organizations will have more than 1,50,000 clients, right? Even if they have more than 1,50,000, say suppose if they have 3 lakh client machines, hardly you require two primary sites. And for two primary sites, since you have multiple, prim the moment you have more than one primary site, you require a CAS server, right? So since you have, say suppose 2,50,000 end user machines, so you require two primary sites. And since you have two primary sites, you require one CAS server. Make sense? And yeah, child PS with local site. So if you have a child primary site uh, with local site DB, it can handle only up to 50,000 machines. And you have child PS with remote site, one lakh. Secondary site, as I was telling you, so mag uh, if any machine, if you have more than 500 machines, you require a secondary site and it can handle maximum up to 10,000 machines. So if you have more than 10,000 machines, that means it's not a branch anymore. You have to have a primary site there. You cannot handle with a secondary site, right? Okay, what is the uh, CAS and PS? PS is the primary site. CAS is the uh, central okay. administrative site. So we have looked into Toronto, right? Toronto is the CAS here. And primary site is like Houston. Okay. 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 And uh, MP in uh, primary site. So each management point can take care up to 25,000 machines. Okay, and I told maximum you can have uh, 10 uh, in a primary site, right? That doesn't mean that don't do the maths like 10 primary, uh, 10 management points and each management point can take care of 25,000. So that means 10 into 25,000, 2,50,000. A primary set can handle up to 2,50,000. No, that's not true. Primary set can only handle up to 1,50,000 clients. So you, you, what you can do is for 1,50,000 clients, you can have like maximum up to 10 management points for load sharing, right? And uh, MP in uh, secondary site. So you can, I told you in only you can create one MP in the secondary site. So it can handle up to 10,000 machines because the secondary site limit is 10,000. So it can, uh, an MP in secondary site can handle up to 10,000 machines. MP in primary site can handle up to 25,000 machines. Any questions guys? Uh, no. no. Okay. Okay, so th th this is the la last thing uh, for today's session. Uh, I just wanted to give you the client support numbers. So let me just uh, quickly go go back. Um, wait a minute. So those all are uh, decided uh, numbers, right? I mean, uh, not more than we cannot utilize. On yeah. That part. Not more, not more. So when I say primary site, so I'm just going back to this example. So if I have to tell you here, when you have Houston. Houston uh, standalone primary site, it can handle up to, you can have 1,50,000 clients in Houston. So it can take care of it. Say suppose you have Houston, Seattle and Boston. So what you can do is, for Houston, 1,50,000 clients it can take care. So including Seattle if you have 10,000, Boston if you have 10,000. So you can have 10,000 here, 10,000 here, and you can have 1,30 here. So that primary site can take care of 130 plus 10 plus 10, total 150 clients, right, under this primary site. Right. Similarly, when you're talking about um, uh, CAS server, so Houston can take care of 1,50,000, London can take care of another 1,50,000, Shanghai can take care of another 1,50,000. So there is 4.5, right? So if you have one more region like India, like uh, unlike 1,50,000, so the maximum Toronto can take care about is up to 6 lakh clients, right? So, so you can uh, you can have uh, uh, 1,50,000 in each of these locations. So those were the numbers that I've just shared with you. And I just wanted to go back and see if you have any questions. So do you have any questions? Let me go back to the first slide. And I'm just uh, closing up the session for today. Um, tell me, do you have any questions in inventory management or software deployment? 
so the basic understanding did you if you have not understand what compliance management is what software just go ahead and ask me a question here do you have any questions here okay. no manash okay i consider no any questions in the evolution part you're good here okay i, I consider you're good here SM components, site boundaries, client agent, database, console, site servers, and site systems. Any questions here? Only with the distribution point, but I guess I, uh, once the practical has completed, mm -hmm. completed, we can, I can have a much clarity on that. Sure, sure. Once we get into so, the details uh, of it, yeah, go ahead. So reporting service point and uh, site migration point. So these uh, were involved or uh, not involved, right? I think. No, that's what I told you, right? So it, the site systems are not just these five. You have so many site systems, okay. like almost like 11 or 12. So as I mentioned here, etc. So there are like 11 or 12. I just wanted to tell you like um, there are for each and every role, you have a different one. So I told you for user data migration, you use state migration point, right? for user data migration from Windows XP to Windows 10 that's where state migration point will come when you want to run any reports you require reporting service point so these are there are almost like 11 12 uh, different kinds of servers so once we get into the console I'll show you all these servers and I'll explain about them in detail yeah maybe yeah if uh, possible like uh, uh, docu uh, if any documents are there like this uh, how, uh, point was explained here for the remaining uh, of five can you give so that I can just uh, refer it and uh, read it so that I can get some information? Mm -hmm. So basically, um, one uh, good thing about Microsoft products is for uh, Microsoft products for everything you have this TechNet articles and TechNet documentation, right? So what I can give you is I can give you those links for TechNet. Uh, wherein you, yeah. it talks about uh, individual site systems or you know all these components. I can give those TechNet uh, links and you can go through them. Is that okay? Uh, yeah okay so any other questions in the hierarchy or the scalability numbers or we are good here and, yeah and for that uh, SQL server so uh, uh, there is no much explanation here in this uh, so you are going to give a more detail in practical or any uh, documents are with, uh, available with you uh, so, the SQL Server, I didn't understand. Like, what kind of uh, information you are looking for SQL, uh, SQL Server? Like, what what exactly uh, it will do and what we will be we have to refer on that as a part of a reference. I mean, practically, we will just do it. So, before that, we should have some knowledge on it before doing what we, what actually we, coding and all is fine. Other than that, no, no, in SQL Server here, what all we'll do is, as part of installation, you'll just install that SQL uh, Server 2012, right? You'll install SQL Server 2012. And after installing SQL Server 2012, you'll not configure anything in SQL Server. All you'll do it is, you'll install SCCM. So once you install SCCM server, the primary site server and all the management point, distribution point, once you start installing them, and once you have all your client machines uh, with these client agents, automatically these client agents will start writing information into the database you are not doing anything on the database you are not writing on database or you are not uh, uh, making any changes to the database everything is just because you are working on the console backend things have been changing in the database so only time when you require the database is when you want to troubleshoot some issues or when you want to query database for some information which is not part of the standard reports already Microsoft is giving SCM is giving some 200 reports so apart from those 200 reports if you want some detailed specific information from the database only in such times you will open SQL management studio and look, look query it for some specific information otherwise you don't need to uh, work on the SQL server day in and day out you don't need to work on that because I didn't uh, utilize any time or uh, saw utilizing someone part of our SCM so uh, that's why I'm asking a more question yep yep but that's that's the heart of uh, entire SCM because entire SCM runs on SQL Server the entire database so if SQL Server is down then uh, you can, your SCM is down you cannot work on anything you cannot do software pushing software distribution or OSD nothing can be done so that's the heart of uh, entire SCM thing so we'll learn it once we uh, install its uh, SQL right in the practicals you'll definitely understand the uh, the value of uh, SQL okay 
yeah fine guys uh, thanks for your time so we'll meet again uh, tomorrow morning 6:30 right yeah. so you, you want me to, you want me to move this to 6 o'clock or uh, 6:30 is fine uh, 6:30 is fine <coughs> okay yeah 6:30 is fine uh, okay right and uh, th- th- this will get uh, be recorded along with the voice is it Yes, yes. This is recorded right now. Everything has been recorded. Whatever questions you are asking me and whatever I am telling you, everything has been recorded. And these recordings will be available on Google Drive, and I will share it with you. So anytime you want, you can download and uh, listen to this audio and video. You can see the video and as well as audio. Okay, fine. And just uh, give the link now to those uh, which is link you are saying that documents will be available for the front. Sorry. Ah, ah. Some technical. got it got it sure i'll do that yeah. okay. okay take care guys uh, catch you tomorrow yeah. bye bye yeah thank you bye bye